Verbatim theater is something I'd never heard of before. Somebody's personal story is pre-recorded and then an actor plays that recording back in their headphones while speaking the words they hear verbatim. There are seven of us involved in this project to tell unique queer stories and led by Dinos Aristidou. What happens to a gay man at 21? Well, I mean, you've got 21 years of life leading up to that, haven't you? I mean, the first 18 years of my life was spent in Worthing. <laughs> you know, Worthing was Worthing. It was a fairly dull, sleepy, average seaside town, you know, with nothing really, nothing really extraordinary happening. <sighs> and um, I guess I was just a, Quietish, bookish kid. I, you know, I felt like an outsider. I felt like an outsider just from that aspect. It was not uh, suddenly leaving home and going to, well, I left Worthing and went to an all boys boarding school in Germany for a year. And then I came back and went to university in Bradford in Yorkshire. That was, that was sort of, I'd say the sexual awakening happened, not to say that I'd had, had thoughts or um, the idea of being gay was not new, but I just didn't think that was me. That wasn't the image of me being gay in the 80s was. One of my best friends, my best friend at school, had come out at 16 while I was at school. And, and that was quite a big shock. I mean, he was the only 16-year-old. It was, for that time, incredibly brave. He had so little support. In fact, one of the people who gave him a refuge was my mother, which I thought, when I finally came out to my mother, was going to send me in good stead. I'm ashamed to say that I, I turned my back. I did. The older me looks back and says, the reason you did that was you were worried about guilt by association. It was, he was a really, really close friend. We'd been close friends for years. And I thought if I stayed as close to this person, people would say, well, you know, he's gay, so you must be gay too. Let's say our friendship cooled to a dramatic extent. And also, he started to go off in different directions. I mean, he, he made a whole load of new friends. Suddenly, I felt I had nothing in common. I mean, these were the people who were, quote, uh, alternative in the Worthing scene. I mean, Worthing scene, not the gay scene, but the alternative scene, counterculture. Um, perfect description. Hmm. That wasn't me. I, I was the conservative with a small C. I was a bookish boy. Actually, I still know where he is. We haven't corresponded for years now, but um, I, when I came out, I reached out to him. I said, look, I had something I need to tell you. Uh, his first response was, you expect me to be surprised? <laughs> but then he said, and, and you think that makes everything all right, do you? The way you treated me? I thought, yeah, he's right. Actually, it doesn't. We re-established a new friendship, a very different friendship. I'm not saying we're close. I know where he is. He's married. He's living in Kent. It was, it was a very important, he was a very important person in my life at that time. It sort of covered that period of my life. And I did the the, the, you know, the classic thing of coming out as bisexual first, <laughs> to which someone said, well, how could you say you're bisexual? You have never been with a man. But then it, it wasn't until I was just, just shy of 19 that I, that I came out. The year is 1985. I was still married and I was 35 years old. I'd realised that I was a lesbian, but I was in an abusive, difficult relationship and it was very hard to deal with. 
I'd met somebody about five years earlier when I went to college and up till that time I had no real awareness of gays and lesbians that just didn't enter my life. I was a solidly married woman having married at 19. When I went to college, I went to art college, this opened up a whole new area. I was friends with two gay men and, I, and I'd never met a gay man before. And when I was at college, I became friends with a woman who I bonded with and I hadn't expected to bond with them because they didn't seem a very cheerful sort of person, quite grumpy, ill-natured and sharp. But it turned out that they were, a les they were a lesbian and they had other anxieties around being a lesbian between them and their families. Now, Initially, I saw it as interesting, the idea of lesbianism. Sexually, I found it very exciting, very tempting. It opened up the door that I, I, I just hadn't even known existed. The option had never been there. I married at 19 because somebody actually said they loved me. Whether they did or not is another question. So I met this person and we began to have a relationship. And I must admit that I, I w although I was happy in the new relationship and I was still married, which put a lot of pressure on both of us, I wasn't happy to be seen as a lesbian. I didn't wish to accept it. It's, it changed my whole idea of how I saw me I uh, say how I saw me. I lived in London and I saw myself as quite a successful young, youngish woman. Very femme. Um, I loved being very feminine, wearing pretty clothes and hair, makeup, things like that. And I, I, I didn't know how to deal with this because my experience of meeting lesbians was so small. So... It this caused quite a lot of friction with my new partner because they'd already got a life. They already known who they were since they were toddlers, really. This and their children. She had mixed with other lesbians, but spent much time with them. That was her natural way of living, but mine wasn't. It was mixing with in-laws, my parents. It was a very straight world that I'd lived in for 15 or 16 years. And it, the people around me, they wouldn't have understood either because they didn't. They they had an idea that, 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 that there was perhaps one lesbian or gay person to every 5,000 straight people. We, we were ignorant. I was ignorant. I was a Daily Mail reader. I was really ignorant. But... The relationship continued and in the end I did leave my husband which it was actually it was in the in the 80s and I left him and the day that I said that I was going to leave leave my relationship with the the other woman just disappeared because she couldn't take the responsibility Suddenly, rather than having rather an exciting affair on her hands, she was having the responsibility of a woman leaving a marriage and a, a, a very unpleasant and violent husband who might be extremely angry if he found out. So all of that was too much. And I never saw that coming either. I'm not the brightest person when it comes to relationships. And I realise that now that I'm, 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 I'm well into my 60s. Uh, as a boy, uh, I didn't didn't think I was a girl, but I I thought there was diff there was something wrong with me, or uh, because I was the eldest, you know, I invariably looked after the other three in a way, and had enjoyed the rough, rough and tumble with the two brothers 
played outside, every now and then I just felt, I don't feel right. I don't feel like my two brothers are. But as a youngster, I don't really trouble you too much. But I know that I had those thoughts at a very young age. And um, it wasn't until I started growing up um, that I as you get exposed to more things that I was thinking, why do I feel like this? And the question began, began in my head, why do I feel like this? Why do I question whether I'm a full boy? And obviously puberty is um, starting at an early age, going into the teens. And I'm starting to question it. But I'm not doing anything. Um, what I do do is I create a place where I can mentally go and become a girl I can see myself as a girl it's almost mentally played out I create a room I can walk down the stairs to this room and in this room I can be this girl and not this boy and um, um, I do that every now and then I let myself go there and think about it I'm growing up I'm a young teenager and I'm still playing with my boys um with my brothers and enjoying boys' things. Never asked for um, girls' things. And no one would have realised I would have had that view. Um, I was happy to um, play with boys' toys and get boys' toys and be happy about it. But what I was doing in my own head was creating this difference. And I still had this question in my head. Still thought, why do I feel like this? Why do I feel like I'm not whole? Why do I feel like I'm not complete? Why do I question my gender? But I played it out in my head. But I also learned that I thought about it more when I wasn't engaged, when I wasn't doing something I allowed myself to... It would come out. uh, It would be there. But if I kept myself preoccupied, the less it would appear. So, um, in that knowledge, as you get into it, as you're probably going through puberty, teenage years, young man, um, all the norms I'm supposed to be dealing with, I'm supposed to be finding girls attractive, which I did, but um, probably not like most boys would be, you know. I didn't want to jump in their knickers, that's not how I felt. I found them attractive, but... I I realised that I need to have a purpose and dad introduced me to his building business. Uh, I like the creativity of building and I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to become a surveyor or either an architect or a surveyor and I'm going to go into con- construction. But I'm going back, um, going back to what happened. There's nothing happened other than I actually opened the box at that point. I opened the box. But I didn't do it in a massively aggressive way. I'm not that kind of person. I'm a bit of an anorak, really. Very measured. Um, I um, I just wanted to see what it would look like as a woman. Um, but I was too frightened to borrow clothes, wives or anyone else. Um, so I took myself off and bought myself a skirt and a top from m and <laughs> Um, and because I was traveling all around the country for jobs, I would, uh, had a nice car, just deposited them on the boot. And when I was staying in the hotel and, um, overnight, I'd just pop the top and skirt on and admire myself. And, and that, those were the first moments of, um, that cunning, that stealth. Anyway. Anyway, I did it for a while, um, and I realised that I wanted to do more, and and I didn't want it to be so, so. Um, I know bugger all to be honest with you. Um, I had no real sense of education. I remember when I was eleven, and I was eleven. My dad was a new to the world people reader. Um, there was a couple of papers and on a Sunday there was a paper laying on the floor and uh, there was an article about April Ashley and um, I thought 
took it to one side and I thought, Jesus, wept that that can't be me. And it, it really worried me. And then another, the other thing that made me realise that was something was the kinks, Lola. Um, these are like milestones in my education of who I am. Hi. Took me a long time to identify as a lesbian, and longer still to have the courage to act on it. I was a happy tomboy as a child, shy and withdrawn as a teenager. I didn't feel like I fitted in. I was always close emotionally to other girls and women, but thought nothing of it. I conformed to society's expectations, going out with boys, though somewhat half-heartedly, has to be said. Looking back at an early diary, I see my first boyfriend at 16 told me that his friend thought I was a lesbian. I dismissed this as rubbish and I thought he was just resentful because I wouldn't sleep with him. I remember nothing of this as I repressed my true self so much. It wasn't until I was 26 that I fell in love with a close friend and realised it was more than friendship. She was straight so nothing came of it apart from a load of anguish. I was isolated and too afraid of friends and colleagues' reactions to come out. At 30, I finally tired of living a lie and rang a gay helpline and ventured out on the scene. One of the places I went to was a gays who were a discussion group in North London, where a group of women, various ages, sat on, in an enclosed space in the floor in the bookshop and talked about lesbian issues, coming out, family, their dreams and aspirations. It was scary, but also uplifting. Afterwards, we went together to a nearby lesbian club. It was amazing to go inside and see all these women, women dancing exuberantly, clinging close to another woman. I felt energised and excited and free, but also relaxed and at home. There were no positive role models of lesbians in my childhood or teenage years or even at university or I wasn't aware enough of myself to search them out. I conformed to society going out as my friends did with boys and men. I realised that something was missing but I didn't know what. After I'd finally come out and met friends and partners on the scene I realised how important it was to raise awareness of issues affecting LGBT, was not added until later, people. At work, I joined national LGBT groups in the voluntary sector, and at national AGMs, we'd tell our stories and stress how important it was for LGB staff and clients to be treated with respect and without discrimination. A common response was, oh, we don't have any of those around our way. From my own experience, I know how important it is to find other LGBT people and support each other. Since retirement, I've joined the local LGBT charity Rainbow Alliance and taken part in raising awareness in partnership meetings with the council and health and other voluntary groups. Hopefully, this will help some carers not to make assumptions about a person's sexuality and be proactive in encouraging LGBT people to talk about their concerns rather than the workers expecting LGBT people to come out when they could be fearful of the reaction. Without this awareness, several elderly vulnerable people I know are forced back into the closet to hide all signs of their gay life when a carer comes round. I've also been involved in welcoming new people to the many social groups I'm involved with, letting them know there's somewhere they can come and be themselves, find a home, I believe it's important that we can all celebrate our identity, not be afraid or isolated, come together, find a home. Oh, I feel like I'm in my flat and, and the area that I live in. Having all my knickknacks around me and friends can visit whenever they want. And I've in the window where I can see all the uh, birds and animals because I uh, feed the foxes and the badgers. And when the foxes had uh, babies, she brings them here and you can see her running backwards and forwards with the food for them. And the badger comes out late at night. And if 
there's nothing for him. He digs up the earth outside to get the worms. I've got some birds at the moment which are building a nest in the tree opposite my window, which I watch every morning, see whether he's, a, well, they've arrived, because there's two of them, and one does carrying and the other one does the weaving. It's really lovely to watch them. It's like living in a nature reserve. Because <laughs> when I did originally move in, there was uh, a scheme manager and she was really lovely and it kind of helped settle down into it. Because uh, really, this is really quite a straight place and the majority of the people are. But before that, when I was in London, I was just outwardly gay and that was it. This is some years ago, so uh, I've gone, I've gone backwards to how the gay scene's gone, because because uh, uh, years ago I didn't a good night out was if we all got together and we had a drink in someone's flat, and then we'd go out to a club, say Mama's club, which finished about eleven o'clock, and then we'd go somewhere where they had afterwards, and. Uh, and we always asked on the door, but they knew who we were and they just allowed us in. And then we used to go to one which was called the gym. I had a nice bar and and they did suppers as well in there. So it was more like... Um, but the other ones were just like ordinary clubs where they were taking a chance on uh, opening later so that you could go in and uh, later and have a drink. But... As I said, I've uh, gone backwards because, as I said, you know, I used to be out and now I'm in. We used to go to a club in Knightsbridge, um, Esmeralda's Barn, and the club that was there, well, the one above it was owned by the uh, Cray, the Cray Twins, and uh, everyone was always frightened they might pop in by mistake. I was in one club once, and... Uh, these people came in and it was really strange because there were two of them that I was in the army with and neither of us knew the other one was gay. And they came in, but um, I suppose they just went in for a night out. We used to go if, if we were on buses and we'd, we'd have conversations with each other. We used to talk in the Polari and people wouldn't understand what we were talking about about different people, um, males and females, on the buses. Um, we, I don't know, it was like a little, well, not not a little club. It was like a big club, really, because everybody uh, knew everyone else and the majority of us got on. And sometimes we'd have people around. If you were with somebody, you'd invite people around for dinner and things like that. I quite enjoyed it, really. So, as I said, I basically, I did it the other way round. Now that everyone's coming out, I went back in. So we took two houses called Harmony House, um, which were next to each other in Harm Rugby Place. Um, well, we all moved down en masse. So I came to Brighton with 10 dykes and two queens. <laughs> and then we all moved into this house. Um, so we hit the city, or hit the town as it was in those days, um, with this great force of lots of different types of people, lots of different identities, younger, older people who were all very dynamic, all quite activist. Um, and it was a lovely winter and summer of embracing and making very strong friendships, some of which I still have now, which is 25 years later, 30 years later, from that beautiful house. Um, and we lived there for about two or three years in Rugby Place. And for me, it's a real rooting my space in Brighton. It's a terrace street, it's cul-de-sac, has a real bright feel to it. There were a lot of older, certainly older lesbian couples, a couple of older gay men there, certainly a dry queen. And it felt like we were all all reading Armistead Mopin at the time, because that was pre-internet. And it felt like we were living a form of Mopin's early days in these houses, in this space. 
And then gradually, as we evolved, as individuals got jobs, those of us who were working became more activist, we left the house one by one and established other small houses um, around the city that became kind of offshoots of Harmony House. Actually, the house I live now is still called Harmony House because we continue with that space. And one of the things we've always done in our homes, those of us who can, is to have a spare room. And we use that spare room to invite people to, who want to come to Brighton, um, who are either looking to change, to escape, for refuge, for a move or a beachhead, or just to while away somewhere where you can be yourself. Um, with the idea that that's what, harm, what Harmony House was, was when we lived in the original house, we ordered Florida upstairs and we, and people could come and they weren't, weren't refugees in the way that people were running away from violence or, or domestic violence or aggression. If there was space where people would come and live with us as young queers themselves. Um, and then find their own way. And one of the things I liked about those early days is that we lived communally very much so. We grew lots of stuff. We cooked together. Um, there were some straight people who lived with us as well, which is very nice. It was very, very strong allies. But we created this space based on it being a safe queer space, a camp space, a party space, um, and it not being a space where people would be judged on what they looked like or what they came. And I think for me, certainly coming from a small Welsh community, it was amazing that I really created with these people another small community based on my own values. Um, and it connected me to the roots of my Welshness, kind of socialist values, Welshness, which was about supporting each other, being there for each other, providing for each other. Um, and everybody brings to table what they could, whether, whether that was money or, or engagement or work or cooking skills or whatever, that everybody gave something to make the whole, the home, a safe and lovely place. And, and my home, although it's a different building in a different place, is the same space. It's a welcoming queer space that I haven't created. I've been lucky enough to create with other queer people around me. Yes. So I think for me, it's a state of mind. And I think when you travel, you go to gay bars in other parts of the world, and I always do, they feel exactly the same. Same type of pragmatists there, same types of people, although it's different cultures play out in different ways. But it's safe space. It's a space where, well, although it's alcohol based, it's a queer space. It's, it's about not being the other. It's about being part of your own family. Um, and certainly when I go and visit friends who now live all over the world, who were living here with us in Harmony House. I, I, can, I step into that space again. And most of us still have an item or an object that was from the original house. Yeah. And some of their children, some of the women that were living there um, have now had their own children. And they remember that house, which to me is lovely because it's like my granny's place. It's like the hearth, if you will. Yeah. So it, it, for, for, for me, it's it's... It's part of my formative experience in Brighton and how Brighton at that time, which is much cheaper to live in, was much easier to get big spaces, how, how the city, how the town itself allowed us as young queers to develop a space um, that we could look after each other and, and then export. I felt quite a bit of anxiety initially, mostly about giving the respect to another's life, but also about my performance and how it would be seen. Would it be good enough? to convey the importance of someone else's life story and making visible the anxiety that we all probably feel as we get older about having to go back into the closet. So uh, for me, directing verbatim theatre on Zoom uh, was proof in the end that, that some creative processes emerge from what seem at first very, very extreme limitations and restrictions as somebody who, you know, is passionately committed to live performance. Um, and what I discovered uh, was that in the end, the creative imagination knows no bounds um, because what seemed like at first to me, unnecessary restrictions and limitations and all the frustrations of working with Zoom and working with the pre-recorded voice um, actually turned out uh, to be immensely creatively liberating. For me, the power of verbatim theatre is that it gives me the chance to inhabit someone's story and provide the storyteller with the opportunity to make potentially sensitive material, but important experiences public. This then supports the preservation of older people's histories, 